this evening and we're just going to look into God's Word for a few minutes and it's wonderful to do that. Would you turn your Bible please to Matthew chapter 5. Let's go back to Matthew chapter 5. If you remember before Easter we were reading the first part of Matthew chapter 5. It's the opening part of the great Sermon on the Mount and their blessed sayings of the Lord Jesus. And we noticed a few of them. I think the first four we, we were looking at just weeks in a row before Easter. I want to take you back there again because there's one or two we haven't looked at and they really say something to us. So we're going to just read Matthew 5 from verse number 1 to verse number 7. And let's just take note of these blessed sayings that the Lord Jesus declared. And remember, they're for you, they're for us right now. And may the Lord apply them to our hearts. So Matthew 5 and verse number 1, it says, And seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain. And when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Remember we saw that bankrupt within. That's where we start with the Lord. Nothing in my hands I bring. Simply to your cross I cling. Just as I am without one plea. Poor in spirit. Then blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. And then just listen to the next verse. Verse number seven. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Can we bow our heads one more time as we ask the Lord just now to bless his word to our hearts. And Lord, you see us tonight. You see your servant going up to the hospital. Lord, be with him and the family up there. And thank you for every brother and every sister who has come out again because their heart is set on you. Lord, will you bring your word to all of us? Will you indeed bless it to our hearts? And in us, will you glorify yourself? Lord, speak to us this evening. May your word have free course, and may it find a resting place in all of our hearts. Because we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're talking about the merciful. That's what the Lord Jesus described here. That's who the Lord Jesus described here. If you note know that again, the merciful. He said, blessed are the merciful. We're going to look at what he's saying here. The merciful. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Now, brothers and sisters, I, I really want, and I feel the need, actually, to try and prove to you that there is a mercy investment that we must make. There is such a thing, and I want you to try and catch this tonight, and understand it together. Maybe you haven't thought about this before. You've heard the word mercy. Of course you have. We sing about it. The word of God tells us about it. But I wonder do we all realize that there is an investment of mercy. That every one of us have got to make. There is such a thing as a mercy investment. You see, Jesus said, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. And the truth of that is underlined like this. 
As we give mercy, we get mercy. We have got to be merciful. You know why? Because the Lord is full of mercy. Come on, say a big amen. amen. The mercy investment tonight. Now, we need to bear in mind that much of the Sermon on the Mount is in direct contrast to the spirit of the religious leaders of Jesus' day. They were called the scribes and Pharisees. They had one way of doing things. The Lord came with another way of doing things. And much that he laid down here is in direct contrast to their ways, to their attitudes. The Pharisees were anything but merciful. They were strict. They marked every letter of the law. And as Paul put it, every jot and tittle, every last detail, every minute, minute detail, they marked it. They held it up high. But with that, they were anything but merciful. And not seen in the gospel stories, like in John chapter 8, and you'll remember in John chapter 8, there's a woman who was caught in adultery. And here's what we're told. Just listen to this. Then the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses and the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? And they said this testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down, stooped down, wrote on the ground with his finger, as though he did not hear. And when they continued to ask him, he raised himself up and said to them, he who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. He had a different approach. And those who heard it being convicted by their own conscience went out one by one, beginning with the oldest even to the last, and Jesus was left alone. And the woman standing in the midst, now listen to this. When Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those who accused you? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. I've read that to you to show you the contrast. To show you the difference. The scribes and the Pharisees had one heart. Jesus had a different heart. The scribes and the Pharisees had one agenda. The Lord Jesus, brothers and sisters, had a different agenda. On one hand, from the Savior, there was true mercy. On the other hand, from the scribes and Pharisees, there was a lack of it. The Pharisee's attitude was she needs to receive what's due to her. But with the Lord Jesus, there was no condoning her sin because he said to her, go and sin no more. But also, there was no condemnation. He said, neither do I condemn you. And then he said, go and sin no more. No more. You see, there was a difference. And those religious leaders had one mindset, but they miss mercy. And brothers and sisters, tonight, you can't miss mercy because God is full of it. And we ought to thank God that He is full of it. We can't forget mercy. Because the Lord Jesus said here, Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. We're talking about the merciful tonight. We're talking about mercy. Do you know as well that there's a difference between grace and mercy? 
And we hear grace and mercy mentioned in church circles a lot, but there is a difference between grace and mercy. Grace essentially is getting something that you didn't deserve, and mercy is not getting something that you did deserve. The woman caught in adultery deserved to get stoned, but the Lord had mercy on her. We deserve the condemnation of God, but the Lord's had mercy on us. Oh, come on, say a good amen. We deserve to go to hell, but the Lord had mercy on us. Can't forget that. Can't get over that. That's fundamental in your Christian life. That's what the Lord's table's about every Sunday morning. He'll bring you back to that. He brings me back to that every Sunday morning. I love the hymn that we sing often at the Lord's table when Pastor George leads us. And that, near the cross, near the cross, be my glory ever. Because when we come to the Lord's table, we come near the cross and we remember it again. And we remember that we're loved and forgiven. But you see in that great hymn, there's a line that says this, near the cross, O Lamb of God, listen to this, love and mercy find me. Love and mercy find you. That's where we were found. Love and mercy find us. There's a difference between grace and mercy. Grace is getting something that you don't deserve. Mercy is not getting something that you do deserve. And the Bible says over and over and over again about the Lord, his mercy endures forever. You read through the Psalms, you'll read it. His mercy endures forever. You read on a little bit more and talk about the Lord, and then I'll put a little punchline in saying, His mercy endures forever. You read another few chapters and then do another book, and it'll tell you about the Lord. It'll remind you again, His mercy endures forever. The Bible emphasizes that. You know why? Because we need God's mercy to keep enduring for us. We need God's mercy to endure forever. It's a common theme in God's word. And it was a common theme among God's people of old. In fact, they rejoiced in that fact. They praised God because of that. They just honored him because of that. They shouted about it. His mercy endures forever. And so should we tonight. Because without mercy, we are nothing. Now we take that and praise God for that. But then we come to Matthew chapter 5. And Matthew chapter 5 is these blessed sayings of the Lord Jesus. They're called in theological terms beatitudes or beautiful attitudes, if you want. And we come to it and it says here, Blessed are the merciful. And in Matthew chapter 5, the Lord Jesus takes this further. And it says, you ought not just to be thankful for mercy. You ought to show it. You ought to show it too. There's going to be times in your life, in your relationships with people, and your dealings with others, and your pathway through this life, when you and I are going to come to the challenge of being merciful. And justice is the opposite. This is not justice, this is mercy. And the Lord says there's a mercy invent or investment. Blessed are those who are merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. The measure by which you obtain mercy is conditioned on the measure on which we show it. Jesus said, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. And that's the mercy investment that we're talking about. We need to understand that. There's a mercy investment. You give mercy and you get mercy. Blessed are those who are merciful, for though they shall obtain mercy. And that's a theme in the New Testament. 
I was reading the other day a verse in James, and I, I, I feel the need to read it to you because it's amazing what this verse says. I don't think I've, I'm sure I've read it before as you have had, but it hasn't registered with me. But just in the last couple of days, this verse from James chapter 2 really came home to me under the subject of mercy. Here's what the book of James 2 and verse 3, or verse 13 says. Sorry, can we put that on the board? Can we, can we do that? I'd just love you to read this and, and think and look at this maybe even. James 2 and verse 13. Here's what it says here. For judgment, James 2 and verse 13. Let's look, look at it there. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Can you get that? There's a lot to take in there. For judgment is without mercy. The person who shows no, no mercy will, will receive mercy. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. I love the last part. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Don't you love that? Mercy triumphs. Do you know something? Mercy is a triumph. Mercy will challenge you when you've got to show it. But when we do, it's a triumph. We must always remember the Christian faith doesn't glory in judgment, condemnation, or even justice sometimes. The Pharisees done that. They gloried in that. The triumph of Christianity, brothers and sisters, is in forgiveness and mercy. Amen? Come on, say a good amen. The triumph of our faith tonight doesn't glory in justice and judgment and condemnation. That's not the things we glory in. The cross is a glory because of forgiveness and mercy. If you read in the Old Testament, you'll remember what King David said. He made this great statement. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who should stand? And then he said this next. But there's forgiveness with you. And that's the triumph. That's the glory. The Beatitudes are Jesus' way. They're the kingdom way. Not the religious order of the day that the people knew through the scribes and the Pharisees. And we must remember as we read them, to be a Christian is to have a different heart. To be a Christian is to have a different mindset and also a different response as well. And mercy is at the heart of it. Mercy is at the heart of it. You know, as I saw something a while ago. You know why you're watching some things? And I don't know if you're like me, but you're watching, but you're not watching. And you're daydreaming half the time. You're thinking of other things. And something's on in the background. And I think we're all the same. And, and you're taking it in, and you're not taking it in. Your mind's wandering and all of that. And whatever it was, was on. It came to this bit. And I, and I, I think it was a movie or something. But there was a martial arts teacher and he was teaching his students martial arts. Karate, I think it was, or one of the martial arts. And he was so passionate and so loud and proud and the young students were there and he was training them with like discipline and, and strength and all of this. And, and, and one of them laid down and he wouldn't get up again. He trailed him up to his feet and, and the other guy was hitting him again and the instructor was shouting, no fear and no mercy. No fear and no mercy. And I want to be honest with you, folks, listen. You see in that moment, it just hit me, the idea of a world without mercy. Can you imagine that just for a minute? A world without mercy. It's a terrible thought. A world without grace even. Someone wrote a book, What's So Amazing About Grace? And the first chapter is about thinking about a world without grace. And it really sets you thinking what it would be like. A world without mercy. It's not a good thought, brothers and sisters. Recompense. Condemnation. 
judgment all of the time. There was something in our framework, in our thoughts and feelings that we've all got them. We always need mercy. We always need mercy. Now listen to Micah, the book of Micah, chapter 6 and verse 8. And this is a great verse because it shows you what the Lord wants from you. If you're ever asking yourself, what does the Lord want from me? What's the Lord want from me? Here's what Micah 6 and verse 8 says. He has shown you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Isn't that lovely? And at the heart of it, it says, to love mercy. To love mercy. This verse tells us he requires, the Lord requires us to love mercy. Love showing mercy. Eager to display it. That's what the Lord wants, to love mercy. And, and that's the heart of God himself. Now, there's ways of showing this, of course. And we can take this in a practical way, and, a, and I think we need to, in, in, in practical avenues, just for one or two minutes more. But remember what this is all about. This is the blessed saying that the Lord Jesus laid down. The mercy investment. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. And there's times in your life when you're going to have a challenge and everything's crying out for justice. But you're going to be asked to show mercy. And how does that manifest itself? Well, it manifests itself Mercy shows itself in forgiveness. Mercy shows itself in forgiveness. A world without mercy, a world without forgiveness. What would that be like? You couldn't even begin to think about that. Mercy shows itself in forgiveness. You see, this is one of the sad facts of life, if you think about this for a minute. This is one of the sad facts of life. Let, let me say this to you. I don't know if you've thought about this before, but I'd love you to try and take it in. Hurt people hurt people. Anybody get that? Come on, say good amen if you want. Do you know what that means? Hurt people hurt people. It's a cycle. It's a cycle. Hurt people, hurt people, hurt people, hurt people. Do you know why Jesus came? To break the cycle. Do you know why Jesus came? To flip the script. We've said that before. Flip the script. The script's written. Say, I can't, the, flips, the, the script's written. It's what I am. No, the Lord changes all of that. He flips the script. And brothers and sisters tonight, hurt people, hurt people. But Christians, more than anyone, need to break that cycle. And it can manifest even in our lack of forgiveness. And say, well, well I'm not going to forgive. And, and, and we can carry on in a cycle of all of that. Christians, more than anyone, need to break that cycle. Why? Because the one we serve tonight was hurt more than anyone. The one we serve tonight was put on a cross. You know what he said when he was hanging on it? When he was in agony, and there was no words to describe the pain, they had to invent the word. And the word they invented was excruciating, because the word excruciating means the pain that comes out of the cross, the pain exiting the cross, excruciating. It was so severe. And what did Jesus say? Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. And mercy, brothers and sisters, manifests itself in forgiveness. And everything in you is going to say, no, it's not right. No, it's, there's got to be justice. By the way, all the best trying to work out the word justice and what justice means. Because lawyers, lawyers will tell you, when people go to law school, the first thing they study is what is justice, and no one can tell you what it is. Because justice means something to one person and something else to someone else. 
Justice is so abstract, it's ridiculous. And everything in you from the sin, no, I need this and I need that. But the Lord says, can you have mercy? Mercy manifests itself in forgiveness, but mercy also shows itself in ministering like Jesus. Ministering like Jesus. Now, needs come in many forms, and, and there's always needs. There's needs everywhere. In fact, the world is a needy place. And needs come in many forms. The reality is some people have got themselves in their own messes. Like the woman we read about in Luke, or John chapter 8, caught in adultery, got herself in that mess. That's the truth. No one forced them to take the first step. No one made them inject the first needle into their arm. Justice says they've made their bed, now let them lie in it. Mercy says, give them your heart. Justice says, they've made their bed, lie in it. That's an old saying, isn't it? Anybody ever heard that saying? My mum used to say that all the time. You've made your bed, now lie in it. And I was thinking, have you in the bed yet? But, <laughs> but I knew what you meant. You've made your bed, lie in it. You know what mercy says? Give them your heart. The eye of mercy, if we look on the needy solely with the eye of what is right, what's fitting, we're not estimating with the eye of mercy. And you know what? The Lord looks at you and I with the eye of mercy. I know I need his mercy. I'm so glad that the Bible is full of saying his mercy endures forever because I know I need it every day. Jesus said, blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy. A world without mercy. We live in a world where so often there's such a lack of empathy and sympathy and, but as Christians we can't allow ourselves to be conformed to this world. We've got to be transformed and the word of God does that. Micah 6 and 8 says, he showed you what is good as to love mercy. To walk humbly, do justly, love mercy. By the word, that first part, do justly, it's living right. And then to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. That's what the Lord requires of us. And the truth is, when you love, when you have mercy, you make yourself vulnerable. You, you make yourself very vulnerable. You can get hurt. Do you know what, what the scripture says? I'm on the end tonight, but do you know what the scripture says about the Lord Jesus? You know this, we, we mentioned it at Christmas. He became flesh and dwelt among us. You've heard that. John 1, 14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Did you ever think about flesh? Did you ever think about your flesh? How soft it is? Did you ever think about your flesh? Just look at your flesh. I'm looking at my arm and I, it's soft. I'm, I'm squeezing a little bit and I'm feeling a little bit of pain. It's vulnerable. It's vulnerable. He became that because he loved us. And he put him on a cross and he pierced his flesh. And it's risky to be merciful because you will get hurt. And it is vulnerable. But let me say this too as we end. It's even more risky not to be vulnerable because you become hard. You become something that doesn't resemble the Lord in any way. Can I leave you with, with what C.S. Lewis said? C.S. Lewis was from Northern Ireland, by the way. He was born in East Belfast. And to this day, the world, the theological world, reveres C.S. Lewis, more than what we do in Northern Ireland. But here's what C.S. Lewis said. To love it all, is to be vulnerable. Love anything, and your heart will certainly be wrung out and possibly even broken. If you want to make sure of keeping it intact, you must give your heart to no one, not even an animal. 
wrap it carefully round with all your hobbies and nice little luxuries. Avoid all engagements and entanglements with people. Lock your heart up, safe in that coffin of your own selfishness. But in that casket, safe, dark, earnest, your heart will change. It will not be broken. It will become unbreakable. Burr, redeemable, hard. And brothers and sisters, there's a risk in being loving and merciful. But there's even a greater risk in not being. Because we've got to be like Jesus. Come on, say a good amen. You know what I just love about the people's church? Since the day and hour I've ever come into it. It's a house of mercy. The people's church knew nothing. It's a house of mercy. And if you read in John chapter 5, you'll read about a pool called Bethesda, and we're told all the sick folk, all the needy folk, all the lame went to that pool. And you know what the, the word Bethesda means? And the pool of Bethesda? Here's what it means. A house of mercy. And if, if there's no mercy in God's house, there's no hope. The Lord bless you. Lord, thank you for tonight. Thank you for Pastor John. Thank you for the band stepping in, Lord. Thank you for Pastor Tom like, looking after things. Thank you, Lord, that no matter what, your work goes on. Your work goes on. And that's important. Now, Lord, separate us with your blessing. Lead us on, Lord, with yourself. Remember that other family. Those two brothers go back to England. Lord, whatever was said in that crematorium today, Lord, may somebody out of those ten people, somebody give their life to Jesus. Lord, we pray that. Lord, the seed is sown. We sow every week in this church. We sow every week, Lord. Now, Lord, let the harvest come. Bless your people tonight. Separate us with your blessing. In the precious name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. 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 Brothers and sisters, once again, thank you.